Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the latest episode of Cryptosophy, hosted by Max and Doyle. So yes, um, in case you missed our last podcast, Max and I have um, decided finally upon a, a proper title for our podcast, um, which is Cryptosophy. So that's a, a compound word, um, meaning hidden wisdom. And ultimately, we think that um, both our project of reading the Western texts, but also our interviews of various specialists from diverse backgrounds. Um, both of those projects are attempts to tease out um, the hidden wisdom that's kind of hiding um, right in front of every one of our faces. And th the goal um, of this podcast and of the, the projects that we undertake is ultimately to find those gems of hidden wisdom wherever we, we can and ultimately use them to uh, to make ourselves better human beings. Yeah, I was also thinking it, it brings nicely together the uh, crypt or like cryptocurrency contemporary element with the philosophy element of ancients. So indeed, there there might have been some uh, some uh, good branding uh, in, involved in picking the name. I don't know. <laughs> Certainly. <laughs> But uh, no, it's it's certainly a word with with multiple layers of meaning, and uh, so hopefully y'all like it. Um, hopefully y'all care. <laughs> um, as far as housekeeping, nonetheless, again, this this podcast is really about you know just Max and I trying to make ourselves better human beings by really being grateful for the 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 great books that have been handed on to us and the wonderful human beings that we have the privilege of living near and around and among. Um, and if if in the process of learning some things along the way and sharing those with others through this podcast and, and that makes the world a little bit of a better place, then I think it'll be, um, it's, it's worth it for that reason alone. So, okay, Definitely. with that, Max, uh, anything else to say before we jump right into this week's podcast? We did just put our podcast through an app called Anchor. And so Cryptosophy is now available on uh, your Apple podcast app and your Android podcast app. So you can now access it on your phone uh, rather than just YouTube. Yeah, and that was actually a really cool um, just discovery, the fact that there's a platform out there that exists. When, the, the first time I tried to do a podcast, such a thing didn't yet exist. So it's nice that you can just kind of have a one-stop shop to put it up on a whole bunch of platforms without a whole lot of work. Yeah, exactly. And I think for most people, listening to hour and a half conversations is not easy with a web browser open. So on-the-go listening is much more convenient. Indeed. Awesome. Cool. Well, Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. Indeed. Max, tell us why it matters. Why did we read this book and why should our listeners suffer through the next hour and a half where we talk about it? Oh, uh, well, I, I jotted down four reasons. This is a highly unextensive list given what you could talk about. Uh, the first is simply that uh, Aristotle's book, given its progression, its reflection on virtue and the good life is something that could contribute to anyone's life. And it's so thorough and long and um, it frames ethics in such a clear and interesting way that simply reading the book, uh, one could seriously improve their life. The second is that um, this book is really the foundation of virtue ethics. Some people try to locate the foundation in uh, um, Plato, but uh, virtue ethics is one of the three major ethical schools, uh, one being deontology or duty-based ethics and the other being utilitarianism. Um, and some authors have claimed that this is the first real book of ethics along those lines. So this this book really, um, it's it's the origin of a form of metaethics, um, but also this form just recently in the 20th century resurged after falling out of popularity um, in the time of the Enlightenment from Christianity. The third thing, just a short thing, is that uh, Aristotle's account relates to cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, which is sort of the habituation of a negative mental pattern into uh, positive mental patterns. And you can find a good description of that in relationship to ancient wisdom in Jonathan Haidt's piece, The Coddling of the American Mind. Um, 
And then uh, Daniel Goldman in his book, Emotional Intelligence, also references Aristotle extensively on his discussion of uh, emotions and in relation to the research that he's done, I think, at the Yale uh, Center for Emotional Intelligence. So people are still quoting and relying on this text in the context of modern neuroscience. And then the last thing which I wanted to ask you about, Doyle, is the impact that this work had on Christianity. Yeah. Um, well, I, I, I don't pretend to be uh, any kind of expert on this, but it is clear that virtue ethics as a school is one that is adopted by particularly mainstream Catholicism. Um, I don't, don't know exactly the um, precise genealogy of how that happens. I would assume that Thomas Aquinas and his um, co-adoption of Aristotle um, kind of in some ways, point blank, he refers to him as the philosopher and regards him as a sort of authority on uh, on a lot of matters, though not exclusively. So I would assume that that has something to do with its instantiation in Christianity, but um, particularly um, the the cardinal virtues that are outlined not only here in in detail in the Nicomachean Ethics, but also just kind of more generally what we learned from Plato's Republic about the four cardinal virtues, temperance, courage, uh, wisdom, and justice. Those are, are heavily co-opted by Christianity as the four cardinal virtues. We still refer to them. You can read about them in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, um, but they are specifically talked about more in, a, in, a, uh, in an Arist Aristotelian way, um, which is to say that its virtue is a, um, is a state that is um, achieved through habituation, um, and it's a mean between two extremes that are both vice. So, um, so it's kind of, so it's interesting that the virtue ethics, um, at least for, with regarding the, the cardinal virtues that we get in Christianity, is is sort of uh, a synthesis, really, of of um, the I would say the content of of Plato's virtues and the form of Aristotle's virtues. Yeah. And I would just add in the uh, historical timeline that Machiavelli is the first person to uh, reject the Aristotelian model of ethics. And you see that continued in Bacon and Descartes. And so the scientific um, thought process that emerges in the Enlightenment really comes out of a refutation of this text. And um, I think that shows that it's historical importance that these authors um, Hobbes as well attacked Aristotle so heavily because his work on ethics, politics, and science were so influential for the next, you know, fifteen hundred years at least. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, and that's and that's kind of a hallmark, really, of of modernism more generally is a refutation of the ancient ideas that more or less had persisted up till then. And what's fascinating to me, and I'm just kind of learned this recently by reading Christopher Dawson's The Crisis of Western Education. It's that the classical, um, you know, classical philosophy, appreciation of classical literature, and all of those things doesn't die with modernism, despite the fact that, you know, you read, you pick up Bacon, you pick up Descartes, and, you know, a lot of these thinkers and their, their positing systems that are fundamentally opposed to what Aristotle's talking about, and yet, Aristotle still re remains um, a center point, at least in education, you know, up through the early 1900s, right? Yeah. So it's, it's, it's much more recently that Aristotle has been displaced from the popular imagination as the authority on ethics. Yeah. However, I, I do want to repoint out the, the cognitive behavioral therapy and uh, Daniel Goleman's emotional intelligence that the theory that Aristotle creates about human psychology in the ethic is corresponding to a relatively high degree with our understanding of um, the brain, psychology, and human well-being, and um, especially in terms of habituation, addiction, uh, emotional regulation. So there might be a connection between science and Aristotle now that was not available uh, in, the, in the initial rejection of him. Great. So, I mean, I guess with that um, groundwork, why we decided to read the Nicky Mack and ethics of all of the possible books we could read, um, I think it might be best to go into just a, a summary of the work as a whole. 
we can present some of our initial reactions to the text, um, just kind of um, ad hoc, right? What, what struck us as we read it. And we'll let that kind of evolve into a con conversation. And then we'll go from there to our moral takeaways as we always end these podcasts with, and we'll call it a night. Right on. All right. So the, um, the Nicomachean eth ethics itself is broken out into 10 books. Um, for those of you who haven't read any Aristotle, what's really kind of a unique feature of his writing is that he um, very rarely has a beginning, middle, and end of a book. You might think of these books as a series of beginnings that ultimately culminate in a conclusion that takes into account um, a synthesis of all of these previous tries. Um, I know that that's true of the metaphysics, which we'll discover even more when we read it for next time. Um, but it was certainly clear here from the Nicomachean Ethics, because at the beginning of book one, it's like you're starting a book. And then at the beginning of book two, it's like, oh, I'm starting a different book. And then at the beginning of book five, it's I'm starting a different book yet again. Um, and can I also say, just from uh, some of the commentators I read, the book is seen as the um, book that comes before the politics. So mm -hmm. book uh, Aristotle's politics. So book 10 is really like the introduction to the politics. Indeed. Uh, so it's not even a book contained in itself for Aristotle's whole thought, but I, I apologize. Go on. Yeah, no problem. So, so that's kind of just an overarching structurally. That's kind of how it feels. It feels like there's um, a number of different things at play. And, but what I found particularly interesting, and we'll get into this is the narrative arc gives it a sort of unity that perhaps you wouldn't think just by merely reading the beginnings of what seem like perhaps three or four different books. So, so book one deals with, um, you know, ultimately trying to paint a picture of what ethics is all about, trying to give us just a very broad, in broad strokes, what ethics points at. Um, and the first sentence is, is, I think, quite indicative of the kind of inquiry and the kind of science that ethics is going to be about. Aristotle writes, every craft and every line of inquiry, and likewise, every action and decision seems to seek some good. Um, so ultimately, from the very beginning, we're, we're told that everything that we do in life, every discipline in which we engage, every action, all of these things are pointed towards something that we consider or deem to be good, and that that good gives not only meaning, but gives um, kind of gives us an, a, a, a method with which to pursue whatever it is that we're pursuing. So in the case of the ethics, um, we're going to posit that the good itself, right, is that end to which the the ethical science or kind of more commonplacely referred to in the ethics is really the political science is pointing at this good. Um, so book one focuses on trying to sketch out what happiness ultimately is, because that's what um, Aristotle would posit as the, you know, final ultimate good of uh, human being. And that's something that gets kind of sketched out further as we go along. Um, so this discussion of happiness ultimately leads us into um, discussions of what people say about virtue. Um, people say that virtue is opposed to vice. Um, and, you know, just Aristotle constantly is engaging with multiple different ways of speaking about things. Um, and then takes kind of cherry picks a bunch of different things that people are saying that, oh, virtue is just the opposite of vice or that um, whatever. And then he, he uses those as material to supply his own definitions. And ultimately what he comes to the conclusion is that virtue is a mean that exists between um, two vices. Both of the vices are excess in one sort or another. One's an excess and one's a deficiency. Both are excessive in a way. Um, and then this leads us into ultimately discussions of the individual virtues themselves. He starts out with a long discussion about temperance or about with bravery, excuse me, before going into temperance, two virtues that we heard about in, in uh, Plato's Republic. And then he goes on to talk about some, some interesting other virtues. Uh, and I hope that in the course of our conversation, we get to some of them, uh, beneficence, magnificence, generosity, wit, interestingly enough. Um, and has a very long discussion of what justice um, is or would seem to be. And then at the end of this conversation of the, of the virtues themselves, it's almost like the book 
ends and starts again with book five. And we, all of a sudden we start talking about, um, you know, wisdom, knowledge, prudence, and, um, scientific knowledge. And all of a sudden we're having what seems to be an epistemological discussion, um, where he's outlining the definitions of prudence, definitions of scientific knowledge, definitions of understanding. Um, and it seems like it's, it's kind of divorced from what's just come before, but then we, we enter book six and that's where we start to really get into the crux, I think, of Aristotle's ethical theory when he talks about the distinction between continence and incontinence. And there's a reason, in my opinion, that the discussion, the epistemological discussion has to come before that because ultimately Aristotle wants to claim that there are, there are four states or conditions of man. There are those who are vicious. There are few of them, but they are the ones who commit evil and take pleasure in doing so. And then at the other end of the spectrum, you have the virtuous. And likewise, there are very few of them, but those are the ones who do good and experience pleasure in doing good. But in the middle, most people fall into a category of either incontinence or continence. And these are people who understand the good. They know it, right? Um, one of them, the incontinent person, doesn't act in accordance with that knowledge, but rather succumbs to the pleasures and thus acts viciously, but he does so with pain because he knows what's good. The continent person, on the other hand, knows what's good and does the good, but he does it with pain also because he hasn't fully integrated those um, parts of his soul towards a true desiring of the good. So he still desires to run off and go do bad things, but he does good things out of the knowledge of the good. And so it would seem that there's this um, necessary epistemological discussion that takes place in the middle of the book before we get Aristotle's really robust theory of continence and incontinence. And this leads into a very long discussion of friendship and the importance that it plays um, to living the virtuous life. Um, and ultimately, that leads us to book 10, which, as Max said, is functions more as a, an introduction to Aristotle's politics than anything else. But it's a, also a book about pleasure and happiness and the, frankly, the role and the importance of pleasure, particularly once it's been integrated and one finds pleasure in doing good actions. So uh, with that summary kind of in place, Max, I'd love to just get some initial thoughts, initial reactions. What was it like reading the Nicomachean Ethics? It's certainly, it's certainly difficult, difficult that we have brought up. up. Um, there, there was, there's just, there's, a systematic moving through every issue. Um, but I think that the real difficulty comes from all like trying to combine all of these unique pieces that you just mentioned and still seeing them as a whole uh, ethical theory when you leave it. You know, the book is sort of like wandering through a maze of reflections on human life. But I think in, in that sense, it's confounding. But in another sense, it is extremely illuminating because it really forces you to move through um, these various elements of human life that uh, I think often go unconsidered. And he even points out often are nameless in, um, in that we don't have a word for these aspects of human life. Um, but really, I think the book struck me as a meditation um, simultaneously being a work of philosophy. Did you have a different reaction? No, I mean, I was, I, I think there's a temptation um, and heck, maybe it's even right there. I think there's a, a common view that Aristotle is a very systematic thinker. Um, our own training, you know, kind of taught us to resist putting Aristotle into this systematizing box um, and to try and read more deeply into what he's doing um, with each book and with each sentence really. But, um, you know, with that in mind, I think it, it, it can sometimes strike us that he is so systematic sounding, right? It's like every, every section starts off similarly with um, either unpacking um, various ways in which words that he's about to describe are used in common speech. Um, so how is it that people commonly refer to justice? And then he goes through a couple of different definitions of what people mean when they say justice. You know, that's 
things that are just are in accord with the laws, things that are just are paying back one's debts, things that are just are, you know, pursuing the good. And so he unpacks those kind of commonplace meanings and then, you know, supplies his own sort of definition that contains within it both an acceptance of certain parts of those previous usages, but also rejects certain of them for various reasons. Um, and then oftentimes he'll go in, if he's not starting with um, a discussion of a way in which a word is used in common day speech, he'll talk about some paradoxes that exist um, regarding certain topics. Um, uh, one, one that particularly struck me was that the, um, the incontinent fool does the, uh, performs the good all the time because he doesn't know, or is it the incontinent fool? Yeah, it's he doesn't know what's good, so which is to say he knows what's bad, but he's incontinent, so he doesn't have the pleasure to do what it is he knows to be right. So he ends up doing the opposite, but because he was a fool, he didn't actually know the good, he knew the bad, so he ends up doing the good. Mm -hmm. um, so that's so that's just an example of the kinds of things that Aristotle will do at the start of a particular section before kind of unpacking them. And this kind of what seems to be a rote method that Aristotle has of doing this thing, I think lends itself towards viewing Aristotle as a systematic thinker. And I think precisely insofar as Aristotle has, you know, a core principle, um, you know, a first principle, which would probably be something along the lines of um, the four causes that we'll get to in in the metaphysics, that would be something along the lines of what Aristotle's first principle of his entire philosophy would be. And insofar as he tries to be consistent with that first principle, it seems systematic. But I also think that, I think he's doing just something much deeper than that. There's a, particularly in the, in the ethics, what was striking me kind of constantly was the extent to which that he cares that whoever's reading this is actually learning something and being, being made more ethical by the process. And um, it was strange because it's, it's, it's a work that, like I said, comes off as very systematic. And yet as you're reading it and you're experiencing it, it's like you, it's like you know the lecturer and he's sitting up there at the front of the lecture room and you can tell that even though he's being systematic and wrote, he's doing all of this for the sake of you so that you would be better. So it's very personal at the same time. Um, the way that I was formulating this is that the, the system that he lays out is both perfect or it's an attempt at perfect rigidity and maintaining perfect flexibility mm -hmm. so um i was connecting it with what we talked about in the last podcast about wittgenstein and language not being a single a single thing um and he, you know, in in the book one, he rejects Plato's account of the form that there the forms that there is an ultimate good, um, and he ends that section by saying that the good would not be something common, universal, and one. Hmm. Um, for if it were that case, it would be spoken of in all the categories, or not in all the categories, but in one alone. Hmm. So I think that the tendency to um, make it a merely systematic work of philosophy is really to miss the the breadth of the subject matter he's trying to tackle, which is all of human life and its its proper function, the proper yeah. function of a human being. And so, to to put it in mere systematic terms would really be to miss the complexity of human life that he's grappling with in the text yeah and i think that i mean you hit the word on the head it's the complexity right i mean aristotle above all acknowledges that that what he is trying to do is something that's so complex that it's in some sense foolish to attempt to lay out an account of how one could live in the world that is as complex with as many infinite dis different decisions that we would face all of the time and he admits on on more than one occasion in the book that um he's trying to create a sketch here. You know, he's not a dogmatist. He's not laying out, you know, lists of sins and lists of virtues, but rather each virtue is grounded in an individual and virtue. In fact, his definition of virtue is precisely that it's the right action in the right way at the right time to the right degree. Um, 
you know, it's, it's super, super particular. And ultimately it's the virtue of, well, it's not even a virtue. It's the state, right. Of prudence. Yeah. The ability to apply knowledge of the good, which is something that's universal, unchanging and necessary and apply that to very particular, very contingent, very changing circumstances in order to do the good with a lowercase g in every um, in every action that we do. And this is precisely why Plato's account of the good can't be true, right? Because the good of you and I doing this podcast, right? So that would involve each of us being articulate and expressing ourselves, having done our proper preparation, not making a whole lot of speaking errors, right? And ultimately the good would be that listeners would enjoy it and learn something in the process. That good is very different from say the good of, you know, playing basketball, where the good of playing basketball is to score the most points and ultimately achieve victory and the honor that's associated with that victory, right? Um, and those goods are referred to by the same word, but they're incommensurate. And that's why there can't be this single form of the good, but rather the good is infinitely sub, uh, infinitely instantiated in particular circumstances. Mm -hmm. And also the, the good as the mean between excess and deficiency is always relative to the disposition of the subject. Mm -hmm. Um, so those who those that tend towards the excess of a virtue need to be more deficient to reach the mean, um, whereas those who are more towards the deficient side of a virtue need to have more excess in terms of virtue to reach the mean. And so the 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 model of the mean itself is a way of plotting not only the infinite particularity of ethical situations, but also um the uniqueness of each person's character and so i think he's also trying to encompass all possible human beings and their dispositions mm -hmm. and what's interesting um about this is that even though the good for each um you know craft or action or or whatever could be regarded as different you know aristotle is not a relativist right he remains um, you know, to the point that there is a good and we can know it and we can pursue it, but it's just simply not a, a kind of platonic form of the good, right? There is, it is possible for me to can like look at you and say, you know what, I know because I know you, you're my friend, right? And this is why I think he dedicates two books to friendship. Um, it's like, I can look at you and I can say, I know you, I know your disposition. I know about the circumstances in which you were acting and you acted excessively or you acted deficiently, right? You didn't do the right thing, experiencing the right emotion. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there is, um, there, it is an ethical standard, right? And I think that that can be difficult for, for some, for, for some people, I think it, it could be like squaring a circle, right? Because we definitely grow up in a very relativistic sort of eth ethical framework where the good is, internalized in each individual and it's not possible for me to judge you yeah and th this was there was something really alien to me about the concept of virtue laid out in the book um and just alien in the sense of speaking about virtues in a contemporary context would be an extremely weird thing to do mm -hmm. it seems as if we've lost this whole notion of virtue of characteristics developed through habit that are the results of reasoning well about one what one ought to do and then habituating themselves to that such that they can derive pleasure from doing the good right that type of that way of speaking that there's uh, better and worse ways to live and we could call those things virtue is uh, I think it's completely lost on contemporary ears to a certain extent. Right. Well, I mean, I think the, uh, the, uh, I don't know, what do you call them? The intellectual dark web, the free speech movement. Yeah. I mean, whoever they are, Jordan Peterson, Sam Harris, that group of really right. non, non categorizable thinkers that have kind of formed an odd sort of coalition. Um, you know, one of the things that I appreciate about, all of them and is, is there is their willingness to point out that 
the you know the regressive left or whatever you want to call the other side of them that they're opposing is that they've kind of bastardized a lot of the words that they have co-opted right like justice like compassion like all of these things and taken what was once a veritable virtue which as you were saying is you know through thoughtful deliberation and a prudential application of the universal to the particular situation acting in such a way that you find take pleasure in doing the good right is replaced by oh look at me i'm so just oh look at me i'm so whatever right um and they've they've taken virtues and turned them into virtue signals right such that they can in some sense uh, take the honor and the praise that would go with virtue um without any of the responsibility of actually acting in accord with that virtue yeah well it's a it's a very strange kind of reasoning it it accepts um contradictory and competing virtues as compatible in a fundamental sense um so it just just the social justice movement um more generally it it takes such like such as third wave feminism and then it will take a defense of uh the doctrines of islam as practiced in say uh, saudi arabia and it will it'll say that both are perfectly true uncriticizable as being minority groups there's it's a complete uh relativization of virtue based on sub- the subjective experience of an identity group mm-hmm. um as opposed to a thoughtful and careful contemplation of the universal good right yeah well that it, that admits um just like to summarize I I wrote that Aristotle calls us to that which is uniquely human and further that which is rare among humans. Mm-hmm. The, the the whole project is um of a virtue that is uniquely human is completely alien to the politics and the left that we see right now because there is no uniquely human virtue. Your virtue is in relationship to your identity, your culture, what you identify with, your, your religion. it's not in relationship to you being a human being and what that consists in and ultimately i think that even though it might seem that this would give us the um the support or the love or the kind of the relationship with a community i think that it actually um in a very fundamental way isolates us um right aristotle offers you know close friendship as you know one of the highest goods of this life and one of the key you know aspects of that is a mutual um sharing of desire to to do the to do good right for its own sake um yeah i think that's ex- that, that's exactly what was- well well just to kind of conclude that thought and that's very i mean that's juxtaposed to you know a sort of um you know an identity politics where it's like it's assumed that because we're a part of the same minority group therefore we're friends therefore we have the same ends in mind right and therefore we have each other's backs um there's no it's like there's no accountability to actually um provide a substantial reason for why you and I should care about each other yeah and i think that just putting that at, in context of the intellectual dark web the only thing that the intellectual dark web shares in common is the assumption that there is such a thing as the human good but they radically disagree about what that means you can just take uh Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson's two podcast debates and then also Sam Harris and Ben Shapiro's debates and Sam Harris and um at uh, one of the Weinstein brothers debates is they fundamentally disagree on how to accomplish the human good but what they um share with aristotle is this assumption that the good is in relationship to what human beings are mm-hmm. and not in relationship to um the accidents of birth culture and um other thing or identity that we fall into um i know that was a bit of an aside but i think you can really map on uh the notion 
that Aristotle draws in the beginning that there is such a thing as a good for the human beings in book one to our political situation. And this is exactly what the disagreement's about um, between that group of intellectuals and what might be called the social justice left is um, the intellectual dark web agrees that there is a common good by definition of being human. And um, the social justice group thinks that the goods are entirely relative to subjective experience, identity, the accidents of birth, and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, I think it's important to kind of lay that out at the beginning, right, is that fundamentally what the ethics that Aristotle, Aristotle you know, puts before our eyes and, you know, challenges us to pursue is not at all the, the sort of ethics or, you know, you know, false ethics, really, that I think the the mainstream of our culture is calling us to right a culture of quote unquote acceptance and tolerance and all of these other you know kind of bullshit buzzwords <laughs> you miss diversity ah diversity <laughs> indeed um right it's something it's something more robust right and um because there's it's like you take fundamental uh you know you take yeah, yeah, it matters to you that your friends are good for Aristotle, right? And you're pained when they perform vice, right? Um, because there's a deeper sort of love there because it's a, it's a, it's a, a mutual loving of the good that you both share that makes you friends. Yeah. As opposed to, you know, and accidental features of race, skin color, et cetera. Yeah, and it, it, it's even deeper, too, in the ontological sense that we'll talk about in the metaphysics, but Aristotle's attempt to find what's uniquely good for the maybe ontological category of human being relates to the, the fact that the human being among animals is the only one that can deliberate and use the intellect to contemplate um, the good. And so... I think I think that the the disagreement politically is really a metaphysical or ontological disagreement about what the human being is. Right. And maybe we can return to that in a, a different episode. But yeah, uh, well, I mean, I just wanted to say real quick that anyone who's uh, been made cynical by the political climate, this this book is incredibly refreshing. Indeed. <laughs> Indeed. Well, and maybe just as a final point there, right? I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head there, Max, that the polarization that we're experiencing is fundamentally something beyond politics. It's broached religion, right? It, because we're making metaphysical and ontological claims about human being. And that's, that's the realm of, of religion, right? And belief is the is assent to first principles there. Mm -hmm. Um. So great. I mean, those were some pretty substantial initial reactions. I, I would like to kind of maybe pivot the conversation and, and discuss a, just a few of the, the virtues that we get in, what is that, books two through four um, or through two through five? Because um, it's, uh, it's an interesting list uh, of virtues and perhaps not the ones that, um, certainly not the ones that I was expecting to discover um, upon reading this book. Um, if it's, if it's not too much trouble, I'll just read them out. There's not that many of them. Um, you know, so Aristotle goes through the virtues of bravery, temperance, and then it's contrary intemperance, generosity, magnificence, magnanimity, virtue concerning small matters, mildness, friendliness, truthfulness, wit, shame, and justice in that order. Um, so, I mean, maybe just a couple of, of virtues here maybe need a little bit of uh, fleshing out, particularly magnificence and magnanimity. Those were two virtues that I was not particularly familiar with. Um, so magnificence for, for Aristotle is generosity on sort of a political scale. So a generous person would, you know, give a beautiful gift to his friend, right? And a magnificent person would give a beautiful gift to his city. Right, something of far greater, um, greater worth because it's 
ultimately just like every other virtue, it's the, the worth of the gift has to be in line with um, the particulars of that instance. So it's like, does it really mean a whole lot if you give a nice cup to your city? No. Does it matter a whole lot if you build a bathhouse for your city? Yeah. Like that's actually a substantial change. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, it fits within the, the relative scale of the difference of the two um, virtues. But the fact that the fact that they were, that it was discussed to, to such an extent was interesting, right? Because it's, it's not clear to me that Aristotle is an opponent of wealth. Um, but at the same time, he's no fan of extravagant wealth, right? Wealth, it seems to me, um, for Aristotle, exists for the sake of the virtues of generosity and magnificence. Yeah, do you think that Elon Musk is a good example of magnificence? Uh, you know, it's hard to tell. Um, or you know, I, I don't know too much about his, um, his particular charitable works. I know that he started a, a nonprofit around AI research. Mm -hmm. as well as one around something else I'm forgetting. Um, but I, I think, you know, perhaps a more germane or, or, or relatable example might be somebody like Bill Gates, mm. um, who, you know, having made more money than anybody can possibly comprehend has, you know, a foundation that, yeah, I mean, okay, just like every other human institution has its flaws, but is also trying to overcome five of the, five of the worst causes of death that the human race experiences. Mm -hmm. um, so there, I think, yeah, I mean, I think that people like that um, might be the sort of, mag might be the kind of magnificence that, that Aristotle has in mind. Yeah, I think this, this virtue is also strange because we, are, we tend to think about ethics in terms of individual action. Um, and maybe even, you know, we can talk about bioethics, we can talk about business ethics, um, we can talk about legal ethics. But I guess there's, in the contemporary context, the reflections on ethics are set aside from reflections on politics often and then ethics are smuggled through the back door but something like magnificence really shows that aristotle doesn't see a major difference between the good life and the making of one society better right so politics and or the study of ethics is really the study of the human being in relation to other human beings which is the political society and in that sense ethics is really the beginning of political science or political theory what do you think about so i mean i wanted to kind of let that conversation of magnificence happen without being impeded but i think there's an extent to which we might call people like bill gates or elon musk magnificent but i'm not sure that we would call them magnanimous how do you see the distinction um so so magnanimity um and gosh you know i'm probably going to butcher this because it is a difficult text and certain maybe maybe, maybe i didn't re read it clearly enough but from what i understand magnificence or not magnificence magnanimity is the sort of the sort of virtue where one um I mean, it's the virtue of ultimately the greatness of soul. And it's, um, it's you know, particularly concerned with honor, right? It's, it's the virtue of having the ability to, to receive honors that are worthy of the state of one's greatness. Um, and it's the, the virtue is to not, you know, love honors to death, but it's not to shirk honors to the expense of them, but to, to take the proper... Uh, maybe enjoyment or pleasure in the honors that one is accorded on an, on account of their greatness. Um, and I think that to a certain extent, um, there's a sort of self-deprecating tendency about some people that precludes uh, magnanimity from being a virtue for them. Um, I know I tend in that direction where somebody will give me a compliment and I'll know it's true, but there's a part of me that doesn't want to publicly admit to it's true there's like a sort of false humility that's pulling me back from you know saying thank you for that you know that great compliment or giving me this honor yes you're right <laughs> um I, well i just was part of the discussion in 
book one includes this notion that uh, in order to be good, one must find virtuous and wise people and learn to emulate them too. So I think in that sense, the person who had the virtue of magnanimity would be at the very least uh, visible enough in their virtue that those without developed characters or those who are younger could emulate their um, their virtue and their magnanimity mm-hmm. through observation. Um, so in that way, perhaps we the class of character like Elon Musk or Bezos or whomever, um, they do have possess a certain extent the virtue of magnanimity. Yeah. And I, I don't want to get too into the uh, contemporary weeds here, but I think you've got to look at Musk's businesses as not businesses in the sense of merely for the sake of money. I mean, the attempt in SpaceX to become an interplanetary species, and then you have Solar City and Tesla in order to make us uh, um, get off fossil fuels through a way that's economically viable. These really are, I would say, m- sort of magnanimous social projects that can only be accomplished by business, but their aims are so much higher than uh, profit for the sake of profit. I think that's what might make them social works as much as they are businesses. Mm -hmm. Um, So in that sense, maybe we could apply magnanimity to Musk, but um, was was there more that you had on that? virtue in particular it it struck me as really foreign to my life and my behavior which is sort of what i was reading the text in um in relation to and it made me realize that there's sort of these aristocratic virtues that most people given their um you know given the money they make and their stature in society have no access to exercise right it's like there's i in no way could i be considered magnificent or maybe even magnanimous because i do not exist in a state where those excesses and means are available to me Mm -hmm. yeah And, and that was an interesting um i mean it's an interesting play by aristotle i mean perhaps you know a a critique of his could be that oh he's just an aristocrat and he's wealthy and he's writing for all the other aristocratic wealthy people and you know, as a result, this book doesn't mean much if it falls into the hands of a lower class person. Um, but I, but I'm, I'm almost wondering if, if that's precisely the point. The point is that he's pointing out that there are virtues that are necessary and proper to the wealthy and to the, and to the aristocratic that add burden to them, right? It's like, the fact that the common person isn't bound by these vir- these these virtues is, in some sense, well, then it's easier for them to live the good life, right? Yeah, well, I think also you could flip that to a bottom-up position as well, which is if you follow the life of virtue, um, you are more likely to become in a position of wealth or power or influence in which that would be pertinent to you too. So there's this bottom-up side of it, too, that um, the person reading the text might not necessarily yet have the means to do these things. But if they follow this model, they're more likely to be a person that has greater means in society Mm. or influence. And therefore, um, the attempt to live the life of virtue, uh, a, a virtue like magnanimity, is pertinent to any reader who would attempt the project because the project of living virtuously is going to have positive effects in terms of gaining wealth, influence, etc. So what about some of these other virtues? Friendliness, tr- truthfulness, which is not really so much about, it's kind of almost humility of speech it's like the opposite of boast the opposite of boastfulness and what would be the other extreme um what is the opposite of boisterous like or like boasting boastfulness i would it be like shyness or meekness yeah yeah shyness or meekness so truthfulness is that is that state that exists between there where you're not 
you're not boastful, you speak what is true about your life, but you also don't do so excessively. Um, you know, it's kind of like so some of these virtues are very germane to the kind of life that we live. It's like, well, I should practice this virtue of truthfulness and, and not speak boastfully, but at the same time, take credit where credit is due and not be overly meek either. Yeah. And in this one, he calls this person a kind of plain dealer um, and says that he acknowledges the qualities he possesses are his own and neither exaggerates nor diminishes them. So um, I feel like that virtue in particular is incredibly hard for me because as as soon as I think I'm on to perhaps a good quality in myself, I'm so overcome by doubt that I always end up with an excess overstating something I did or a deficiency. I feel like I really struggle with pinning down a characteristic uh, describing myself that's making contact with reality in the right way. That's not exaggerating or diminishing a quality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, uh, I, I think I, I, I think I struggle with that as well. Um, maybe on the other end of the spectrum, however, I think I am willing to assign myself mastery of certain things that I'm actually a novice of. Um, but uh, again, I, I, what's interesting is how it seems that Aristotle, when he's selecting these virtues, really he has, it's almost like he has particular people in mind. I mean, I, I, I felt like when I was reading this that he was, had written it in some sense just for me, right? Yeah, there's, I don't know, I guess, I think one thing to reflect on in this light too is why these virtues and not another set of virtues? Mm -hmm. I mean, clearly with something like magnanimity, he intends his audience, which would be um, his pupils at the academy, um, he intends his audience to be a group of people with political influence or po influence inside the polis. Um, and yet, I don't know, one of the criticisms of the book is, and this isn't necessarily contrary to the previous idea, is that um, he never really goes into issues more of the passions like uh, sexual pleasure or um, things of that nature that might be more emotional, like one's proper relationship to poetry and literature, which in our case might be Netflix um, and other things of that sort. Like there's, there's this tension in the text of the common human's ability to apply these virtues um, with the aristocratic person's ability to apply these virtues. I mean, do you have any reflection on why these particular virtues were chosen? Well, I can't help but wonder if it's not, um, is it the first lesson, right? You've, you've really learned the lesson when you can take a list like this that you receive in a lecture and you can understand the methodology and the subject matter and then take it and apply the same method to various other domains of your life to discover other virtues that are important to you um, or that you ought to, to live. Maybe he, in these, he's, I mean, in, in a very particular way, these are all very public virtues, mm. very particular to, Right, like you said, people of political influence, wealthy aristocrats, um, people of that sort, and then there's, you know, perhaps, perhaps the idea is once you can. I mean, perhaps it's the same idea as in Plato's Republic, where we look in the city first to find the virtues before we, or to find justice before we look into the individual. Maybe it's the same sort of thing. Like these are the virtues of public life. Now it's up to you to go and find the virtues of your private life. Um, Regarding particularly the the lack of discussion about, say, more bodily things, um, it's kind of interesting what Aristotle does here, right? He, um, the, the, there's a kind of a a really poorly understood critique of um, Aristotle that would say, well, if if virtue is just doing something in the right way at the right time 
to the right manner and to the right degree and all of these other things. Is there a proper virtuous manner in which I can commit what is generally regarded as a bad action? Um, and it's quite funny because Aristotle actually appro uh, approaches this um, um, this uh, objection in the text with the example of adultery. He says, you know, there's there's no such thing as the right kind of adultery because <laughs> adultery is not um, governed by a particular a virtue particular to adultery. It falls within the scope of the virtue of temperance, which is relative to all of the animalistic desires, right? Which is to say that virtues govern not individualized actions. Every different action that you could commit or do has a corresponding virtue, but rather every kind of action that you commit that has a corresponding virtue. And I think that that's what's going on here is that he's trying to outline um, at a very high level the kinds of virtues the kinds of actions that virtues, um, you know, regulate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the the other interpretation that I don't think necessarily conflicts with anything you just said, but that would be an answer to that objection, is that um, the virtues that Aristotle attempts to name are the most universal in a category of goods. And therefore, anything else that we could try to come up with and say he missed would fit within the framework of a virtue he lays out. Indeed. So that... Um, oh, that's an interesting point. So in the same way that temperance differs from bravery, some other sort of virtue would differ from some other sort of virtue that's not mentioned in a similar sort of way. Or one, one would at least be analogous enough to one of the listed virtues for you to have a framework with which to understand it. Yeah, precisely. So, you know, the, the, the universal virtue might be courage. Um, and its most extreme state that Aristotle discusses is uh, courage in the face of death. That's the most universal, most extreme principle, but uh, courage in the face of something like public speaking or meeting your girlfriend's parents um, is, it falls within the category of the more universal. Right, and therefore it provides... It provides the answers to anything we could say he missed. Perfect. That's interesting. That's interesting. I hadn't necessarily considered that. Um, what do you think here of all of, again, of all the things to include, he talks about wittiness, funniness. Mm. And, um, you know, it's the way he starts off the section is rather funny. He's like, since life also includes relaxation. And in this, we pass our time with some form of amusement. Here it also seems possible to behave appropriately in meeting people and to say and listen to the right things in the right way. Um, I thought that what was interesting about this particular virtue was the, the affirmation perhaps uniquely to any, really any philosophy that I've read that, that comedy, like real, like not, not like literary comedy, but like just jokes are, are something that are a, a constituent part of and important and necessary in human life. And I thought that that was a really interesting claim. And I think that, you know, more generally, um, you know, in the context of maybe just, you know, Greek tragedy in the context of comedy in general is that um, we, you, you really miss something when, when philosophy leads you to a life that is so foreign to, you know, everyday life um that should be a that should ring a bell to you if if the life that you think that you're supposed to be living because of your supposed application of your knowledge of the universals to particular situations is leading you to a someplace that's completely um divorced from your the life that you had hitherto led hmm so this person's sort of alienated from the culture and political life in their context or in their life well I, i'm well i'm saying that if you if you can't appreciate a good joke there's something wrong with you <laughs> you're, not, you're not a human like in a, in, a, in a in a precise sense of the word and and again i mean perhaps the the claim here is that yeah i mean philosophy shouldn't lead you too far afield right it's 
the virtuous person looks like a human being, not like an angel. Yeah. It's, it's it's someone who recognizes their duty to their social world in a in a far more powerful way than um, we tend to think of our relationship to the state mm-hmm. nowadays. You know, like the the virtuous person is really embedded in a community and improves that community through virtue. So I think that. You know, Aristotle's claim in the politics is that man is by nature a political animal, or more contemporary way of putting it is that man is a social animal. And ethics directly relates to this world. And when he's talking about friendship, he concludes that the person who lives in isolation is less happy than the person with friends. Mm-hmm. Uh, even if he contemplates the good, because he has no one to contemplate these things with. Right. Well, there's, so there's in the in the so, same in the same way, right? That you get this interesting sort of when he reconstitutes the book at book five and starts talking about the intellectual virtues, gets into continence and continence, um, and even going into you know just the end of the second half of the book, you 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 think because he's positing the human being as this understanding animal mm-hmm. above all, like. That's what he talks about. I mean, he says that like the, the, the essence of human being is our capacity for understanding. Um, you would think that it would lead one completely away from political life. And he says that to a certain extent. And then the very next book starts with what is the introduction to the politics and how it's fundamentally the most important science, mm. right? Which is to say there's sort of a tension between the... Um, there's a ten, there's a tension between the temptations of having the capacity to understand. And I might have a, a solution to the tension. Um, you can tell me what you think. Because uh, in, in book 10, when he gets to discussing contemplation, he says that contemplation is the result of leisure. Um, and you see this with the definition of his school, which was called the peripatetics, which means basically the people who walk around and contemplate. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think the polis is the only place in which human beings can have the leisure necessary to contemplate. Right. In other words, the political and social life is a necessary condition to the highest form of human uh, good, which is contemplation for its own sake. Interesting. So, so your your claim would be that if all of the the philosophers re- retreated from political life to go live a leisurely life of contemplation, all of a sudden the polit- the political world would fall around, fall down around them, and yeah. they would no longer be able to have any sort of contemplation because they would be simply struggling to live. Yeah, precisely. It's it's in a stable political environment, guided by people with good character, that the leisure um that it allows for contemplation arises and in unstable um political environment or a tyranny these things would be impossible and then thus the wise must engage in political life Mm. such that the polis can be in a state where wisdom can both accrue and perpetuate one of the things i found interesting about book 10 and and his claims about um, which is really a book about pleasure, which is interesting to note. Like the introduction to the book on politics is about pleasure, and he talks about pre- precisely the state's role in legislating the um, the enculturation of children into the like the pleasures of life. Um, and it's it's because it's so important that 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 young people are taught temperance, or they're never going to learn it. Um, did you? I mean, it seemed like. Well, I mean, I think it's just generally true that the the government or the the state that that Aristotle has in mind is one that's far more quote unquote intrusive than a sort of state that we idealize here in the twenty first century, at least on the side of the intellectual dark web. Um, what what does that what does that make you think of, or how do you react to that? Um, well, I don't think that Aristotle could have known the positive effects of capitalism and a free market. Um, So 
I, I mean, he obviously favors democracy, but this sort of legislation of morality would seem um, tyrannical to our constitutional values to some extent. Certainly would. But yeah, exactly. I was in in a different sense. I was reflecting on this the other day that I think there's there's only two colleges that I know of that um, maybe three that are just like oriented towards a very specific way of life and discipline. One is Hillsdale College. Um, the other one I think is a crackpot Mormon college um, just because of their rejection of science. And then there's a, an Adventist college that I heard of in Tennessee, that's Southern Adventist University. But I think what, what um, this sort of reflection made me think of was in our universities, our high schools, and so on, we don't really force kids to learn about moral virtue or the good life or force them into conditions where following the rules is necessary to stay in the institution. Mm. You know, all of our colleges and institutions, um, for the most part, are just free reign, um, you know, there's you know, drinking's against the rules, but everyone's drinking. There's no male female um, inhibition. So if you want to sleep at anyone's dorm or whatever, that's allowed. Right. I think I, I think Aristotle's call in our context. This at least was my reflection on that point. Was we need more institutions where people sign up for things that 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 are demanded of them. Interesting. Where where like parents and kids go, I'm going to go to this very difficult, very disciplined, very orderly um, high school or college, and I'm not going to have the freedoms other kids are, et cetera, et cetera, but that I'm assenting to this in a free way in a democratic society to this institution that's going to instill moral virtue. Because there's no inculcation of moral virtue whatsoever in most of the modern or the contemporary universities right well i mean this is you know very far afield but it's it's reminding me particularly of our, that instance at xavier university where a, a freshman was kicked out of school for you know more or less taking a snapchat and making a very contentious um you know, asking a very contentious question that could be judged in certain contexts to be a I racist claim. Didn't even, I mean, I don't even know if it's that contentious. Yeah, well, no, regardless, I mean, just, he was dismissed for violating the, the, well, just a, the code of conduct and was ultimately, you know, plagued a race or, you know, pegged as a racist. But just to describe what happened, she was wearing a face mask of the sort that you wear for cleaning out your pores and making your skin soft. Um, and she took a snapshot of it, and it was a brown face mask material, and it said, why be white when black lives matter? <laughs> but continue. I'm sorry. I just yeah, to well, I mean, the, the, the only reason I bring it up is that it's like we can only point to these. The, the only, my, my point is that the institutions in which we, you know, went to school claim to stand for these moral values and virtues that they're attempting to inculcate in their students through the classes and the curriculum and the life outside the classroom and all of these things. But really what's going on, it seems to me is there's uh, more or less a, an underlying, here are the rules that no one can break. And that's that the, the phil the philosophy of diversity and inclusion that sits at the bottom of this university is the most important thing, and don't you dare cross it or question it. Yeah, it, it's it's incredibly ironic too because um, you're you're uh, you're allowed to be and hold any position, including Marxism, which we described in the last podcast, um, the most deadly political regime that's ever existed on Earth. And if you combined the total deaths in communist regimes, you'd be at like 250 million at least um, killed by that style of government. So you're allowed to be a Marxist, but uh, if you're a conservative and you make a conservative joke, which is in this case, obviously a joke about um, 
a, the, the label of a social movement. Um, that That's off the rules. So right. total diversity and acceptance, unless you're a conservative. And I think that this fundamentally, it really stands at an at a very opposed to what Aristotle's talking about in book 10, right? I mean, he he's talking about a moral legislation on individual lives that is actually meaningful, right? Yes. Um, it's it's not like the president of the university is going to interfere if you happen to violate one of the two rules that they enforce. It's that I actually care about this city and you as a future citizen of this city. And so I'm legislating a, a form of education so that you can learn the virtues necessary to really be free in this aristocratic democratic society. Mm -hmm. Right. It's something far more. It, it's almost like we, you you give up to a certain extent individual freedoms in exchange for a government that's actually small enough and local enough to love you and care about you and to thus have the moral um, the moral authority to make specific claims on actions that you make in your day to day day to day life. Yeah, it will just to make my point succinct, and I'm wondering if this vibes with what you just said. I was saying that. Um, our system of government was necessary for economic flourishing. And I think that's a demonstrable fact. Yeah. And so if we tried to impose a virtue ethic system from the governmental level, that would be a form of tyranny, given the way the Constitution's written. But therefore, Aristotle's version of bringing up the young and educating the young should be at an institutional level. And... Um, that that's what's entirely lacking in our context. Yeah, so, no, I totally understand that. That really makes sense, right? It's like the 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 kind of government that that Aristotle has in mind should be instantiated in our institutions that are actually of the scope in both quantity and quality, size and relative power to actually have these kinds of effects. Yeah. Do you actually know what the population of Athens might have been at the time? Actually, you know, I don't, but what I do know, I think it's in this text, is that, you know, Aristotle uses the two extremes that a city wouldn't be a city if it was 10 people, and it also would no longer be a city if it were 100,000 people. Uh, okay. So it's like he's envisioning a city that's somewhere, you know, presumably in the order of magnitude of the tens of thousands of people. Yeah. And Ohio um, State has more than 100,000 students. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well... Um, that's a whole other set of issues that we yeah. could do. Well, no, I mean, I think, we, I, I think we just happened on something like really cool. That might be a political policy prescription from Aristotle. And that's that you can, it's not necessarily about this national political dialogue that everyone's so stuck in, but it's about reforming these universities, towns, and cities in a way that's more oriented towards, uh, raising virtuous people. Right. rather than the 300 or 400 million people inside the United States. Right. So, well, it also uh, might be, you know, it's just more effective for one, but I mean, the arguments exist all, already, right? I mean, the, the I remember the contentious debate over Common Core a couple of years ago. <laughs> um, you know, it's like those, I mean, okay, whatever, Common Core is a sham, but the point is, is like, there's a very strong notion that individual communities have the, the right and the knowledge to determine what's best for their children to learn. Right. Yeah. So it's like that, that, that desire is already there that there, there, there's already something there that we could use to kind of instantiate what Aristotle's talking about in terms of the inculcation of real virtue. Right. So it's not just, it's, it's not just a matter of curricula, right. It's there's, there's something more that we could use our schools for. Yeah, precisely. And I mean, in, in another sense, too, to use Aristotle, um, top down from a federal level, um, educational standards violate the principle of the mean, which is to assume that every population in every area is at the same place and ready to learn the same things, which is patently absurd. Right. It is the individual in their particular context, habituation and character that one must consider uh, what to teach them, not the, uh, it's not some global standard of 
virtue or education, which would, in this case would be intellectual virtue. Mm -hmm. in Aristotle's word. And what, what's interesting is that this is, you know, just juxtaposed, you know, in what seems to be a paradoxical way with the fact that the human being is fundamentally, well, not, this is what's strange. It's like, it's hard to get a grip on exactly what Aristotle thinks the human is. Like, the political animal seems to be the most robust, um, like two word summary of what a human being is for because precisely because it, there's so much baggage with that, those two words, right? Because, you know, political animal starts, the reason that we're political animal is ultimately because we come about as a result of a form of conversation between a man and a woman namely a seductive conversation that results in a union, that results in a child, that results in a whole different kind of speaking to one another. It's no longer seductive language, but it's the language of, you know, mother, father, child. And then as those families grow, you get a different kind of language, right? So there's a whole lot in that, um, in that political animal phrase. But what's interesting is the number of times it seems that Aristotle's honing home, it's like that, no, 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 man is the understanding animal first and now you can't separate those two descriptions right because he would cease to be the understanding animal if he's removed from the polis but there's a fundamental sense in which it's like the understanding right the grasp of first principles right these um these religious claims really right these theological claims about the about the nature of the universe that fundamentally form the 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 commonality that makes all humans human. It's, it's interesting to see, um, despite that view of kind of, you know, the universe, human being on the whole, the fact that there is a single first principle that underlines everything, and yet the hesitation to assume that it must be discovered or pursued or reasoned from in the same ways in every context. I think that there's a very interesting sort of not necessarily paradox, but it's like, it's kind of like trying to, you know, you're trying to, how do you deal with the complexity of the world? Well, you ultimately say that the world is so complex that you don't understand its complexity, which is to say it's pretty simple. <laughs> and yet you're still stuck with acting in it. Right. And, th and that's kind of what I see Aristotle doing there. Yeah. I think that was, that was brilliantly put. I, I don't know if I have much to add to that. Um, but, uh, I, I do want to ask before we move on to life lessons, since we've been uh, happily talking on this political level, um, if there was anything more individual that you found particularly interesting or insightful for living the good life in the text, uh, the day-to-day -day personal level. Yeah. Day-to-day -day personal level. Well, I thought that. I mean, I was really struck by the, you know, more or less the, the, the third beginning to the book at the beginning of book five, when he starts talking about the intellectual virtues, um, most of which aren't virtues, by the way. And that's what's super interesting, right? Because it's like, oh, I've been talking about all these virtues of character, like temperance and courage and things. And now I'm going to talk about the virtues of, virtues of the intellect, of which I don't think he really lists one, right? It's like, he, he goes through, it's like they're commonly referred to as virtues, but it doesn't turn out that any of them actually are virtues, I think, except perhaps prudence. But prudence is more like a state than, than a virtue, I think he says. Um, and I'm wrong. It's not the beginning of book five. It's the beginning of book six, excuse me, um, beginning of the second half of the book. Um, but so, I mean, I, I was particularly struck kind of like by the, by the careful the carefulness with which he makes some of these these distinctions between various I mean like we we kind of want to we would throw around words like knowledge and understanding and wisdom and prudence we might recognize a superficial kind of distinction between them but it's but Aristotle really takes the time to um, outline what they are and what they mean and I think that um, gosh. I'm not really answering your question about how does this stuff apply to my my day to day life, but I found um, oh, in craft knowledge is ultimately the last one, right? But um, well, what do you? I mean, I thought that that was at the very least the distinction between the intellectual virtues and the moral virtues was an extremely liberating fact because it means that you can have a 
very quiet intellectual life and yet still live a life of virtue. Right. I I thought that um, maybe sort of to use Plato's Republic sense um, that people in the um, capitalist or craft class, the appetitive side of the soul, that it could become good without becoming wise. Right. And I thought that um, on a personal level, you know, I think a lot of us, and I'd speak for myself, had I had terrible habituation when I was a child, or I became terribly habituated as a result of culture and pleasures and caring about the wrong things. Um, but the fact that you might not have to understand all of the specificity and implications and you know, like the ontological status of morality to become a virtuous person, I thought was an extremely liberating personal fact. Right. That you could be virtuous, you could lead a virtuous life without all of the baggage and study that might come from contemplation or philosophy. Right. Well, I mean, I think there might, I, I, I kind of want to push back a little bit. I, I think that Aristotle, particularly insofar as prudence, is what allows you to make decisions like to make virtuous decisions and to do virtuous actions right prudence is a an application of a universal good right which is to say you have scientific knowledge of a universal good and you know how to apply it in partic particular circumstances using reason right mm -hmm. and that's what gives you prudence uh, okay. that's what prudence is and that's how ultimately I'm act with virtue I would alter my statement to not a perfectly moral life, hmm. <laughs> but a, a, a moral or a life according to virtue, nonetheless, that wouldn't necessarily be continent or incontinent, you know? Right. Right. Well, I mean, I think I'm, I'm to, reminded to, to of go back to go back and bolster what you said. Mm -hmm. I think because we also have the ability perhaps not to have direct knowledge or understanding of the good. We can take each other seriously when, when Max, you tell me that something is good and I need to habituate myself towards it, even if I don't precisely have the, the understanding of that good or the prudence to apply that good to a particular circumstance, at your insistence, I can apply the habituation necessary mm. to pursue that, to pursue that good. Yeah. Right. And so I think, so to that extent, I think you are very right. Um, and that there is definitely a lot of room and, and a necessity because, I mean, ultimately, Aristotle's talking about the habituation towards virtue from the earliest ages, you know, before people are, quote unquote, reasonable, right? And that's, in some sense, for Aristotle, the make or break period. It's like, if you don't get them as, an, as children, like, you might, they might be lost forever. And that's why this education thing is so important. And we need to have our legislatures involved in it. Mm. Indeed. Indeed, and that's what and that's what's just really striking. Maybe as just a final word from at least my end about the text is that the 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 urgency it seems with which that Aristotle writes this is is pretty striking because again it's a super dry sort of systematic seeming um, explanation of virtues and then drawing all these distinctions between you know intellect intellectual things and then definitions and premises and all these things and yet it just kind of drips with this real desire that people be better yeah and, and that it's written for them so that they could act virtuously no i do want to like I, I exactly i do want to say it right the the main lesson that i derive from this text and a personal reason why i think it's so useful especially in relation to what i said at the beginning about it corresponding in a deep sense to our current psychological understanding of the human mind is that the good life is actually possible. And I think that most people forget this most of the time, you know, and mm -hmm. like the whole text is oriented towards that precise claim that right. the good life is actually possible. And mm -hmm. I think that that claim is so foreign to contemporary wisdom and um, contemporary culture that it's worth reflecting on. 
Um, and it's something I was reflecting on the whole time I was reading the text. It's like it, if like if accepting the the premise that the good life is possible and there's a way to get there, how would I live differently? Mm -hmm. And I think that we would do a lot of things different, both on the personal and the educational and on the political level, if we admitted that there were better and worse ways of living. Right. Indeed. So do you, is that your moral takeaway? It is not. No. Oh, okay. Great. Well, Real quick, I think uh, that, that was a final, like, final great statement upon do you have like just three start. minutes. I just wanted to touch one really cool and important part of the text, which you commented on um, before the podcast, but I wanted to just quickly mention his discussion of friendship. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Just because it's, it, it's so integral to life and the reflection itself is, um, it has so much depth and interesting elements to it. Was there, was there something in particular in his discussion of friendship that you found interesting or useful? Yeah, I. One of the things that it was cool to see laid out, right, is ultimately Aristotle claims that there are three kinds of friends on the basis that there are three kinds of loving things. You can love things for pl the pleasure they give you, the usefulness they are to you, or for their own sakes. And that because there's three kinds of loves, there must be three kinds of friends. And that's that's mostly an etymological thing in Greek because the word for friend is the same. It's like the loved one. Um, in, in in English, um, but what but what was nice or or not nice, but what was I thought insightful about um, the kind of friendship that Aristotle talks about is that you know it's friends who are friends for the who love each other for their own sake, right? Which is to say, in sort of like a Kantian way, and like this could you know gosh spiral off into a discussion about the relationship between virtue ethics and deontology but in sort of a Kantian way it's like the friend regards his friend as an end in of him, end in himself who is you know endowed with rights and whatever but also more importantly like someone to whom I am accountable and I am accountable for and um in a very odd way it's like once you orient yourselves towards the good you start becoming pleasurable to one another and quite useful to one another. One, because they help you pursue the good most further, but two, because you are living together most often. And he, claim, he makes the claim very, very straightforwardly that, you know, the best of friends ought to live together. Um, mm. And, um, but it's like once, once you take any, like, once you take any sub- subpar good like wealth or getting what you want out of people out of the equation and you start having a friendship that's based on a mutual desire for the good all of the things that you would have gotten from having a friendship on the basis of utility or pleasure you get anyway mm. right it's like when you are friends with a person in the genuine sense and you love them for their own sake and you both are pursuing the good you make each other better in terms of pursuing that good, which is awesome. But then you also provide to each other all of the other benefits that you could. It's like you get to be funny around each other and you get to introduce each other to your relevant social networks and whatever. Yeah, you know, it's like, so it's, what, what I found was interesting is that you can, that friendship, real friendship is so robust that um, you get all of the benefits um, and none of the drawbacks when you have real friendship yeah yeah those were those were really cool parts to read and it was it was very interesting to claim that for the many they only have friendships that are either on the basis of utility or on the basis of pleasure and that is why they come into conflict with their friends so friendship for the sake of the other person results in no real tension um and that pleasure or friendship on the basis of utility or pleasure is where we see um betrayal lying um people saying that you owe me money etc mm -hmm. uh, and i thought that that was an extremely useful reflection on friendship that 
you know, I think I think this goes to book one, two, and the definition of virtue. Um, the the for its own sake aspect of friendship really ties into this for its own sake of doing the right thing as well. Right. And um, I don't know. There's a, there's a lot of reflections there, but I think that um, it's worth reflecting upon one's friendships and asking what they're based on. Indeed. Because I think so many people fall into pointless suffering, assuming that friendship is one thing for one person when to the other person it's based on utility or pleasure, et cetera. Right. On a sort of, you know, humanitarian front, um, I think it might be at the conclusion of the section on friendship. You know, Aristotle talks about self-love and the virtue of self-love. And ultimately, you know, he makes the claim really that um, self-love is a virtue and you have to love yourself because if you don't love yourself, you can never know yourself. Um, that's in there, but, but further in on the kind of the humanitarian front is that in a friend, you're loving you in them, mm. right? It's, it's a fundamental, um, like, uh, intersubjective experience of human beingness, mm -hmm. right? It's like you, my friend and I, me share something that's super intimate that only I have particular knowledge of, right? It's like, I only know my own humanness. And insofar as I can see it in you, we have this thing called humanity that I can, you know, take stock of, right? And, there, and he even talks about a whole nother virtue in there that's associated with seeing just the humanness and even strangers and, and yeah. loving it. The, um, the head of the YouTube channel, The School of Life, Elaine de Botton, has a video, I think if you just type in um, Botton on romance, he has a lecture on how um, the common wisdom in con the contemporary time is sort of to accept the vices of your friends and say, oh, that's how they are, um, or your loved one in this case. But in uh, romantic relationships, what we should aspire to is to love the virtue in the other person and not the vice. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think just as a recommendation for anyone listening, if uh, it's a really awesome philosophical reflection on the element of friendship of uh, seeing yourself in a romantic partner and only admiring the virtuous qualities. It's a really counterintuitive and enjoyable lecture. I just wanted to bring up one more point on friendship in Aristotle before we move to life lessons. Sure, and, and, I, and I might have one more point on happiness because I mean we can't talk about Aristotle's ethics without talking about his concept of happiness. So I can't believe we haven't touched. it. I know. <laughs> <laughs> that just—I mean—that just goes to show what kind of book this is too. <laughs> there is just so much here. I uh, just went on the point of friendship. Aristotle talks about uh, like-mindedness. And he says, uh, for to be like-minded is not for each to have the same thing in mind, whatever it may be, but to have it in mind in the same way. And um, I thought that was a brilliant illustration of our friendship in that you know, you're know you Catholic and I'm not religious. You might tend more conservative than I do on certain things. And it's not that we have the same thing in mind in our friendship. It's that we have the same thing in mind in the same way. Right. Uh, and I thought, you know, like-mindedness, it, it's really touching the principles on which someone lives. Mm -hmm. And that uh, I think we find friends in very uncommon places, not because we share the same thoughts, but because we share the same end or the same way of going about thinking. Right. And, you know, without attempting to sound like superficial or maybe even self-inflammatory, right, I think one of the the fact that you and I are kind of engaged in this project together as, you know, sourced in our friendship and in some sense for the sake of our friendship, mm -hmm. I, I think Aristotle would look really highly on this project that we've outlined for ourselves because it's not an attempt to, to become the same through reading the same books, but rather it's to experience these, these books together and mm -hmm. then to, to pursue the good you know, truly in, in some sense, living together, even though we're not, you know, <laughs> living together, we're, you're in Colorado and I'm in Indiana. 
you know, he couldn't have anticipated the fact that we could have, you know, sort of like face to face conversations all the time and yeah. projects like this. Um, and I think that in a lot of ways, um, you and I kind of espouse a lot of these virtues of friendship in particular that, that Aristotle talks about. Yeah, I think so too. And I think that the fact that that friendship can seem paradoxical at times makes it all the more fun. Right. And useful indeed. But um, to happiness. Yeah, happiness. So one of the, you know, perhaps contentious claims that Aristotle makes is that, you know, you can't really judge someone happy until they're dead. Um, and the reason he says this is because the good life and happiness are not exactly the same um, for him. Uh, and the reason for that ultimately is, right, so the virtuous person takes pleasure in performing the good for its own sake, right? Um, and that's ir kind of irregardless of your circumstances. It's like, I did the right thing today. It doesn't matter whether I'm wealthy or poor. It doesn't matter what else is going on in my life. And I take pleasure in it, right? And so it's like, in some sense, that's maybe the good life. But happiness is something else entirely, right? It's like, it's, it's that virtue, number one requirement. Plus, it's like, well, you actually have to have a certain amount of good fortune, right? And the, the, the daily needs of your body kind of taken care of, right? You need a certain amount of wealth so that you can not starve, for example, and have the time to participate in leisurely activities. Um, and you can't be overwhelmingly beset by misfortunes, right? Like the, you know, death of a family member is, I think, not an example that Aristotle brings up, but one that Cicero brings up in relation to the same argument. Um, you know, you can't be beset by those kinds of maladies all the time because they do actually in infect your happiness, right? Happiness is a comprehensive state of being virtuous, but also being fortunate mm. and over the course of one's entire life. And that's why you can't judge a person happy until they're dead, right? Because you don't know what's going to happen to them tomorrow. Mm. Um, and yeah. I think that there's, there's two things here. There's one, there's the hopeful element that the good life is irrespective of fortune, right? You can have the worst luck in the world. You can be beset by suffering, and we all are, but you can be beset by suffering in a particularly powerful or strong way and still take pleasure in pursuing the good, and that is going to provide you with a certain level of fulfillment. Um, but then there's also, on the flip side of that, there are people that, while they can't, call themselves truly happy because they are not dead yet. Um, they can be very thankful for the fact that they happen to be both virtuous and fortunate. Mm. And, and I think that, uh, and I don't think that Aristotle explicitly talks about that, that virtue of gratitude, you know, towards like being or nature. Um, but I think that it's something that's very implicit in the doctrine of happiness is that, you know, we are not in control of our own happiness. And that require that has a certain onus on, on upon us to one to stay humble, but two to take, you know, to just be really grateful for the blessings that life has has given to us. Yeah, and I think also just in a different sense, it's important to recognize that the happiness that is uh, eudaimonic, that type of happiness, is what people often mistake pleasure for but it is rather the happiness that is only unique to human beings. And so this, this form of happiness is very different from what people might confuse with happiness. Indeed. It's not, uh, it's nothing based. So, I mean, I, I think he uses particularly the example of animals who in so far as they share sense perception with humans, they participate in pleasures um, but it's only in these higher, these higher order virtues that, um, you know, a more robust sense of happiness, a true fulfillment of one's end through one's own, you know, volition to do the right action and take uh, pleasure in it. I, I'm really sorry to drag this out, but because um, Aristotle says that contemplation is a source of happiness. 
in book 10. Mm. Um, and it is like the sort of uniquely human source of happiness that is for its own sake. Right. And this uh, is where he's kind of talking about human being as the understanding animal. Yeah. How did, did you get a good sense of what contemplation was? Because I thought that was the weirdest thing to say that is um, like sort of the highest source of human happiness for its own sake. Yeah, well, I mean, that's what's interesting. I mean, at least, you know, and I didn't perhaps, I'm not reading the Greek here and I didn't pay super careful attention to the vocabulary, but I, there's no section of the book called contemplation where he talks about it, mm -hmm. right? It's like the closest thing that it resembles from what he says about it there is understanding when he's talking about understanding in book six. Or a deliberation, maybe. Or deliberation, maybe. Um, which is deliberation crossed with understanding is wisdom, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Did, but did you get a sense of what contemplation is? Because I, I hope I was attempting to contemplate what contemplation is. And I right. really was struggling to come up with what is this activity? Yeah. Well, I mean, I... I I, I would only know it in sort of like a platonic sense, right? It's like that state of grasping and marveling and awing at the form, right? At being itself. Um, and insofar as Aristotle doesn't really share that notion mm -hmm. of form, um, perhaps contemplation is, yeah, I mean, perhaps it's, the the joy one finds when they see the universal mm. in particular circumstances right so it so understanding then would be a prerequisite to contemplation right because you have to know what the universal good is so that you can recognize it when it's instantiated in the particulars yeah um the the, the interpretive essay says that the contemplative way of life is marked by the greatest self-sufficiency um and i like it's he because we're going to get to this in the metaphysics but that like the god uh in the metaphysics is the god that is able to contemplate being for its own sake constantly or eternally is a right. very strange thing to put at the pinnacle of human well-being um and it's really counterintuitive so maybe that would be a, a question that we can touch on next time but i thought that the vagueness in which he broached the topic of contemplation yet its importance for the um the wise or best life was very strange right well and what also it was strange was that how Immediately after making that claim, he transitions into talking about how, you know, the the impetus to participation in political life, which seems on its surface, and I think he says this, is like fundamentally contradictory to the contemplative life. Right? It's like we're, we're presented with this sort of impasse where, like, we have this highest good, which is pure contemplation, but it's only sustained by yeah, the, the political life that we, that we have, and thus there's need to, to contemplate the good, but then to also go out and, and habituate the good into others so that we can continue to go back to it. So it's like there's, there's these two, there's, it's, it's, it's sort of like an impasse, sort of like a contradiction, or maybe it's just one of these puzzles that, that Aristotle talks about you know, with frequency and kind of leaves the lead, reader with to you know, to kind of figure it, maybe not figure out on their own, but to, to leave them with, a, you know, questions for, for, for food for thought, right? Is how do you, how do you square that circle? Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, it gets, it gets very strange too. And he says that the, the intellect is concerned. Um, it's concerned with the most excellent of things that can be known, but we don't know what those things are from the text. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I guess that we can carry that on to the next conversation, but yeah, well, I mean, and, and maybe just as a final, you know, kind of related point is that it's very clear to me that reading the metaphysics is, is the next, I mean, it makes sense in, in light of what we've learned from the ethics, right? Is that, 
there's um, these intellectual virtues, namely prudence, which you know kind of has as its prerequisite understanding, um, which are necessary for the continent person and ultimately necessary for the virtuous person. Yeah. Um, those those all of those themes are broached again in the metaphysics and this is what's something that's super interesting about aristotle is that he just doesn't shut up about scientific knowledge craft knowledge understanding prudence and wisdom mm-hmm. they come up all the time and like they're fundamental to each of each of the works and i haven't read all of aristotle's works but you know namely this one and the metaphysics i know that they're kind of crucial points there and so i think it's it's a natural next step for us to read that certainly yeah and um, I think there might also be a play here with contemplation. Um, the, you know, like the Buddhist monk or the uh, contemplative religious saint that whatever contemplation might consist in is sort of an unimaginable state of well being that's in relation to being in such a way that only a mature, wise, and virtuous mind can attain. Mm. That there's sort of a pinnacle of. Um, the human intellect and the human mind that people who haven't attempted virtue um, throughout a lifetime and character building and quantum or, and I guess practical wisdom um, wouldn't be able to grasp. It's sort of an indescribable state, which he says is beyond human in a sense. Um, It is something divine. So we will, I hope pin down what that might be in the metaphysics. Hopefully. I mean, Max, I think that's an excellent place to talk about moral lessons and wrap it up. Yes. Thank you for all of the digressions with me. Hey, no problem. I contributed to them as well. So (laughs) (laughs) perfect. Well, um, if it's okay, I'll start. Sure. Um, I wanted to, this is for the first time I'm in the moral lesson. I'm going to be preaching rather than, talking about something that I might need to improve. Um, And that is Aristotle's discussion of emotion. Um, And it's, it's, we, we, we typically run into personalities with two dispositions to emotions, um, at least in my experience. And that's someone who is overcome by every emotion and can't, um, you know, can't, seem to repress their emotions or make them connect with reality in such a way that tempers the emotion. Um, People who might be particularly anxious or particularly given to anger. And then we have people who think that emotion is nonsense, it's supposed to reason, and um, that calling someone emotional is an insult. And I think Aristotle offers the best definition of emotion, which is um, and you can just fill in any emotion here, but uh, it's to be angry, that is easy, that is within everyone's power. But to be angry in the right way, towards the right person, to the right degree, at the right time, in the right place, that is not so simple. And so I think one of the brilliant lessons of Aristotle, and we see this picked up in Daniel Goleman, again, highly recommended book, uh, emotional intelligence, and then his other book, Focus, um, or just look him up on YouTube. He has lectures on these books. But emotion is not the enemy, and it's not the ally either. The character comes from expressing emotion in proportion to the particular situation. And so we don't need to reject emotion. We don't need to overindulge emotion, but we need to figure out whether it's anger, jealousy, sadness, frustration, impatience. Etc. When is the right time? Towards whom and in what way emotions are valuable? And I think just at the level of our culture, we are very confused about um, what the emotions are and how they are to be maximized to create a good life. Um, so yeah, that was it. It's a it's a brilliant lesson in the text and. It's not about the feeling of emotion or not emotion. It's about the expression of emotion um, with all of those particular facets that makes it moral. Great. Well, thank you, Max. Um, For my moral takeaway, um, I think it's a bit more... um, Well, I think 
I, I was particularly gripped by the discussion about deliberation that that Aristotle talks about, and that's the, you know, it's the it's the ability to to really forethink about your actions and hold hold them up to a measuring stick of the good, and to not allow, just as you were saying, to be that kind of person that is so gripped by emotion that they just act um, purely out of an emotional response. And, you know, ultimately I think what he's saying about deliberation is the, is to use the, use the feedback from those emotions, but don't listen blindly to them, but rather to, to really take them as, you know, one voice, one advocate in a courtroom, right. And then, you know, listen to the other advocates and listen to the jury and ultimately come to a decision about what you ought to be doing. And I think that, very often i i wouldn't necessarily say that i'm prone to emotional responses but i would say that i'm prone to action without careful deliberation about the particulars of the way that i'm about to act um i think in general um i do a good job of performing the right action in the right circumstances but i don't i do not at all think that i'm good at doing that action to the right degree in the right context, in the right places, right? So, I mean, I think um, if I, you know, can take away anything from Aristotle, it's that if, if I want to grow in, in the moral life, if I want to learn how to be virtuous, I really need um, to have the ability to take that deep breath before I say something or before I do something um, and ensure not only that I'm doing the right kind of action, but that I'm a, a, a doing it in the proper way. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was brilliantly put. And just real quickly, um, this was sort of at your prodding, but I, I recently began to deliberate on the influence of social media on my life. And um, I've actually pushed several people on deliberating about its utility. So I've been challenging people to give up social media for two weeks, mm -hmm. and that's just to delete it off your phone. Um, and I think any deliberative process about social media will find it wanting as a use of hours of each day of human attention and time. Um, so I, I don't know, I just wanted to add that in, in the point of deliberation, because I've pushed people really hard on what are we getting out of this activity that is so incessant. And um, I've had brilliant results personally literally hours of everyday freed up and i'm certainly not re-downloading them so right. um along with your life lesson thank you for uh prompting that change in my life and i so far it's been an amazing source of freeing up time and attention hey no problem max i mean i think you know you know very clearly social media contributes to and rewards knee-jerk reactions to things mm -hmm. um and that's just, it's not conducive with deliberation. It's not conducive with yeah. moral life. And, and, and that's not to say that social media is evil, but it's just like, frankly, we can do better than this. You know, yeah. well, I, It can't be a source of deliberation because you don't know what you're going to see when you open it up. Right. You're really not deliberating on how to use your time the most effectively or what you're going to get out of this next like, 10 minutes. You're just going to be hit with a wall of either nonsense, other people's lives, political ramblings, whatever it might be. But it's not a deliberative consent to a use of time because mm -hmm. um, it can't be. It's built on a platform where you don't know what you're going to see next. So you don't know how you're going to be using your time, your mind, your energy and so on. Right. That's an interesting point. I hadn't considered it from that angle. I think it's the anti-deliberation model. <laughs> the anti-deliberation model. Great. Well, with that, I think we should wrap it up. How, what do you say? Perfect. Um, we have an uh, interview on this Thursday coming up. I'm going to do the opposite of what Doyle did last time and interview him about his intellectual development in life. Um, but other than that, the next book will be The Metaphysics. Nice. And hopefully, given people's schedules, we'll have a new specialist episode coming up soon as well. Excellent. Um, well, thanks, everyone, for joining Max and I on this uh, this search for hidden wisdom.
This has been yet another episode of Cryptosophy, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you so much.